Hey everyone, Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and I promise you, I have one of the best gifts you can get your partner for this Valentine's Day. Head down into the link below and grab a box from Universal Yums. It is full of snacks from a random country across the world, and every single bit is delicious. If it sounds like something you want, or something you think you and your partner would enjoy to eat together, check out that link at the bottom of the description. You can never go wrong when you order from Universal Yums. Two questions before we get into tonight's stories. Do you believe in the human soul? And do you believe that we will one day have the ability to speak to the dead? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. And think about it real hard while you're listening to tonight's stories. Because, trust me, these are really, really interesting. Of course, I shall not pretend to consider it in any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of M. Valdemar has excited discussion. It would have been a miracle had it not, especially under the circumstances, through the desire of all parties concerned to keep the affair from the public, at least for the present, or until we had further opportunities for investigation, through our endeavors to effect this, a garbled or exaggerated account made its way into society and became the source of many unpleasant misrepresentations, and, very naturally, of great deal disbelief. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts, as far as I comprehend them myself. They are succinctly these. My attention for the last three years had been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism, and about nine months ago it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen, first, whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence. Secondly, whether, if any existed, it was impaired or increased by the condition. Thirdly, to what extent, or for how long a period, the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process. There were other points to be ascertained, but these most excited my curiosity. The last in especial from the immensely important character of its consequences. In looking around me for some subject by whose means I might test these particulars, I was brought to think of my friend M. Ernest Valdemar, the well-known compiler of Bibliotheca Forensica and author of the Polish versions of Wallenstein and Gargantua. M. Valdemar, who has resided principally in Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person, his lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers and violent contrast to the blackness of his hair, the latter, in consequence, being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions, I put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed with the other results, which his particular constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control, and in regard to clairvoyance, I could accomplish with him nothing to be relied upon. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him, his physicians had declared him in a confirmed thysis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching disillusion, as a matter of neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was, of course, very natural that I should think of Van Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him, and he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. I spoke to him frankly on the subject, and to my surprise, his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, for although he'd always yielded his person freely to my experiments, 
He had never given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was of that character which I would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination and death, and it was finally arranged between us that he would send for me about 24 hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of the disease. It is now rather more than seven months since I received from M. Valdemar himself the subjoined note. My dear P, you may as well come now. D and F have agreed that I cannot hold out beyond tomorrow midnight, and I think they'll have to hit that time very nearly. Valdemar. I had received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in fifteen minutes more I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for ten days, and was appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lustrous, and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbones. His expectoration was excessive. The pulse was barely perceptible. He retained, nevertheless, in a very remarkable manner, both his mental power and a certain degree of physical strength. He spoke with distinctness, took some palliative medicines without aid, and, when I entered the room, was occupied in penciling memoranda in a pocketbook. He was propped up in the bed by pillows. Doctors D and F were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand, I took these gentlemen aside and obtained from them a minute account of the patient's condition. The left lung had been for 18 months in a semi-osseous or cartilaginous state and was of course entirely useless for all purposes of vitality. The right in its upper portion was also partially if not thoroughly ossified, while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tuberals running one into another. Several extensive perforations existed, and at one point, permanent adhesion to the ribs had taken place. These appearances in the right lobe were of comparatively recent date. The ossification had proceeded with very unusual rapidity. No sign of it had discovered a month before, and the adhesion had only been observed during the three previous days. Independently of the thysis, the patient was suspected of aneurysm of the aorta, but on this point the osseous symptoms rendered an exact diagnosis impossible. I was the opinion of both physicians that M. Valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow, Sunday. It was then seven o'clock on Saturday evening. On quitting the invalid's bedside to hold conversation with myself, doctors D and F had bidden him a final farewell. It had not been their intention to return, but at my request they agreed to look upon the patient about ten the next night. When they had gone, I spoke freely with M. Valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution, as well as, more particularly, of the experiment proposed. He still professed himself quite willing and even anxious to have it made, and urged me to commence it at once. A male and female nurse were in attendance, but I did not feel myself altogether at liberty to engage in a task of this character with no more reliable witnesses than these people, in case of sudden accident, might prove. I therefore postponed operations until about eight the next night, when the arrival of a medical student, with whom I had some acquaintance, Mr. Theodore L., relieved me from further embarrassment. It had been my design originally to wait for the physicians, but I was induced to proceed, first by the urgent entreaties of M. Valdemar, and secondly by my conviction that I had not a moment to lose, and he was evidently sinking fast. Mr. L. was so kind as to accede my desire that he would take notes of all that occurred, and it is from his memoranda that what I now have to relate is, for the most part, either condensed or copied verbatim. I wondered about five minutes of eight when taking the patient's hand. I begged him to state as distinctly as he could to Mr. L. whether he, M. Valdemar, was entirely willing that I should experiment on the mesmerizing him in this condition. He said feebly, yet quite audibly, Yes, I wish to be mesmerized, adding immediately afterward, I fear you have deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. 
He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead, but although I exerted all my powers, no farther perceptible effect was induced until some minutes later after ten o'clock, when doctors D and F called, according to appointment. I explained to them in few words what I designed, and as they opposed no objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones, and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible, and his breathing stertuous, and at intervals of half a minute. The condition was nearly unaltered for a quarter of an hour. At the expiration of this period, however, a natural, though, though very deep sigh escaped the bosom of the dying man, and the stertuous breathing ceased. That is to say, its stertuousness was no longer apparent. The intervals were undiminished. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven, I perceived unequivocal signs of the mesmeric influence. The glassy rule of the eye was changed for that expression of uneasy inward examination, which is never seen except in cases of sleepwalking, and which is quite impossible to mistake. With a few rapid lateral passes, I made the lids quiver as in incipient sleep, and with a few more, I closed them all together. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously, and with the fullest exertion of the will and so I completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer after placing them in a seemingly easy position. The legs were at full length, the arms were nearly so, and reposed on the bed at a moderate distance from the loins. The head was very slightly elevated. When I had accomplished this, it was fully midnight, and I requested the gentleman present to examine M. Valdemar's condition. After a few experiments, they admitted him to be in an unusually perfect state of mesmeric trance. The curiosity of both the physicians was greatly excited. Dr. D resolved at once to remain with the patient all night, while Dr. F took leave with a promise to return at daybreak. Mr. L and the nurses remained. We left M. Valdemar entirely undisturbed until about three o'clock in the morning when I approached him and found him precisely in the same condition as when Dr. F. went away. That is to say, he lay in the same position. The pulse was imperceptible. The breathing was gently, scarcely noticeable unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still, the general appearance was certainly not that of death. As I approached M. Valdemar, I made a kind of half-effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own, as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient, I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now, but to my astonishment, his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. M. Valdemar, I said, are you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about the lips, and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. At its third repetition, his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering. The eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of a ball. The lips moved sluggishly, and from between them, in a barely audible whisper, issued the words, Yes, asleep now. Don't wake me. Let me die so. I here felt the limbs and found them rigid as ever. The right arm, as before, obeyed the direction of my hand. I questioned the sleepwalker again. Do you still feel pain in the breast, M. Valdemar? The answer was now immediate, but even less audible than before. No pain. I'm dying. 
It was now the opinion, or rather the wish of the physicians, that M. Valdemar should not be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present, apparently tranquil condition, until death should supervene. And this, it was generally agreed, must now take place within a few minutes. I concluded, however, to speak to him once more, and merely repeated my previous question. While I spoke, there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleepwalker. The eyes rolled themselves slowly open, the pupils disappeared upwardly, and their skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue. Resembling not so much parchment as white paper and the circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the center of each cheek went out at once. I use this expression because the suddenness of their departure put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of the breath. The upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth, which it had previously covered completely, while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk, leaving the mouth widely extended and disclosing in full view the swollen and blackened tongue. I presume that no member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors, but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of Vin Valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed. I now feel that I have reached the point of this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief. It is my business, however, simply to proceed. There was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in M. Valdemar, and concluding him to be dead, we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses, when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue. This continued, perhaps, for a minute. At the expiration of this period, there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice, such as it would be madness in the attempt to describing. There are indeed two or three epithets which might be considered as applicable to it in part. I might say, for example, that the sound was harsh, broken, hollow, but the hideous whole is indescribable for the simple reason that no similar sounds have ever jarred upon the ear of humanity. There were two particulars, nevertheless, which I thought then and still think might fairly be stated as characteristic of the intonation as well as adapted to convey some idea of its unearthly peculiarity. In the first place, the voice seemed to reach our ears, at least mine, from a vast distance or from some deep cavern within the earth. In the second place, it impressed me. I fear, indeed, that it will be impossible to make myself comprehend as gelatinous or gluttonous matters impress the sense of touch. I have spoken both of sound and of voice. I mean to say the sound was one of distinct, of even wonderfully, thrillingly distinct, sibilification. M. Valdemar spoke, obviously in reply to the question I had propounded to him a few minutes before. I had asked him, it will be remembered, if he still slept. He now said, Yes. No. I have been sleeping, and now... Now I am dead. No person present even affected to deny or attempted to repress the unutterable shuddering horror with which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey. Mr. L., the student, swooned. The nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return. My own impressions, I would not pretend to render intelligible for the reader. For nearly an hour, we busied ourselves silently, without the utterance of a word, in endeavors to revive Mr. L. When he came to himself, we addressed ourselves again to an investigation of M. Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. I should mention, too, that this limb was no farther subject to my own will. 
I endeavored in vain to make it follow the direction of my hand. The only real indication, indeed, of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory movement of the tongue whenever I addressed him Valdemar a question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. To queries put him by any other person than myself, he seemed utterly insensible. Although I endeavored to place each member of the company in mesmeric rapport with him. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleepwalker's state at this epoch. Other nurses were procured, and at ten o'clock I left the house in company with the two physicians and Mr. L. In the afternoon, we all called again to see the patient. His condition remained precisely the same. We had now some discussion as to the propriety and feasibility of awakening him, but we had little difficulty in agreeing that no good purpose would be served by doing so. It was evident that, so far, death, or what is usually determined death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken in Valdemore would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at M. Valdemir's house, accompanied now and then by medical and other friends. At this time, the sleepwalker remained exactly as I had last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is perhaps the unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving M. Valdemar from the mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed as especially remarkable that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing out of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids of a pungent and highly offensive odor. It was now suggested that I should attempt to influence the patient's arm as before. I made the attempt and failed. Dr. F. then intimidated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. M. Valdemar, can you explain to us what your feelings or wishes are now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather violently rolled in the mouth, although jaws and lips remained rigid as before, and at length the same hideous voice which I had already described broke forth. For God's sake, quick, quick, put me to sleep, or quick, weaken me quick. I say for you that I am dead. I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavor to recompose the patient, but failing in this through total abeyance of the will, I retraced my steps and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I'm sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. For what really occurred, however, it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared. As I rapidly made the mesmeric passes amid ejaculations of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once, within the space of a single minute or even less, shrunk, crumpled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands. Upon the bed before that whole company there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putridity. Whatever doubt may still envelop the rationale of mesmerism, 
its startling facts are now almost universally admitted. Of these latter, those who doubt, are your mere doubters by profession, an unprofitable and disreputable tribe. There can be no more absolute waste of time than the attempt to prove at the present day that man, by mere exercise of will, can so impress his fellow as to cast him into an abnormal condition of which the phenomena resemble very closely those of death, or at least resemble them more nearly than they do the phenomena of any other normal condition within our cognizance. That, while in this state, the person so impressed employs only with effort, and though feebly, the external organs of sense, yet perceives with keenly refined perception, and through channels supposed unknown, matters beyond the scope of the physical organs. That, moreover, his intellectual faculties are wonderfully exalted and invigorated, that his sympathies with the person so impressing him are profound, and finally, that his susceptibility to the impression increases with its frequency, while, in the same proportion, the peculiar phenomenon elicited a more extended and more pronounced. I say that these, which are the laws of mesmerism and its general features, it would be super arrogation to demonstrate, nor shall I inflict upon my readers so needless a demonstration today. My purpose at present is a very different one indeed. I am impelled, even in the teeth of a world of prejudice, to detail without comment the very remarkable substance of colloquy occurring between a sleepwalker and myself. I had been long in the habit of mesmerizing the person in question, Mr. Van Kirk, and the usual acute susceptibility and exaltation of the mesmeric perception had supervened. For months he had been laboring under confirmed thysis, the more distressing effects of which had been revealed by my manipulations, and on the night of Wednesday, the 15th instant, I was summoned to his bedside. The invalid was suffering with acute pain in the region of the heart, and breathed with great difficulty, having all the ordinary symptoms of asthma. In spasms such as these, he had usually found relief from the application of mustard to the nervous centers, but tonight this had been attempted in vain. As I entered his room, he greeted me with a cheerful smile, and although evidently in much bodily pain, appeared to me mentally quite at ease. I sent for you tonight, he said, not so much to administer my bodily ailment as to satisfy me concerning certain physical impressions which of late have occasioned me much anxiety and surprise. I need not tell you how skeptical I have been on the topic of the soul's immortality. I cannot deny that there has always existed as if in that very soul which I have been denying a vague half-sentiment of its own existence but this half-sentiment at no time amounted to conviction. With it, my reason had nothing to do. All attempts at logical inquiry resulted indeed in leaving me more skeptical than before. I had been advised to study Cousin. I studied him and his own works as well as those of his European and American echoes. The Charles Elwood of Mr. Brownson, for example, was placed in my hands. I read it with profound attention. Throughout I found it illogical, but the portions which were not merely logical were unhappily the initial arguments of the disbelieving hero of the book. In his summing up it seemed evident to me that the reasoner had not even succeeded in convincing himself. His end had plainly forgotten his beginning, like the government of Trinculo. In short, I was not long in perceiving that if man is to be intellectually convinced of his own immortality, he will never be so convinced by the mere abstractions which have been so long the fashion of the moralists of England, of France, and of Germany. Abstractions may amuse and exercise, but take no hold on the mind. Here upon earth, at least philosophy, I am persuaded, will always in vain call upon us to look upon qualities as things. This will may assent, the soul, the intellect, never. I repeat, then, 
that I only half felt, but never intellectually believed. But latterly, there had been a certain deepening of that feeling until it has come so nearly to resemble the acquiescence of reason that I find it difficult to distinguish between the two. I am enabled, too, plainly to trace this effect to the mesmeric influence. I cannot better explain my meaning than by the hypothesis that the mesmeric exultation enables me to perceive a train of ratiocination which, in my abnormal existence, convinces, but which, in full accordance with the mesmeric phenomenon, does not extend except through its effect and in my normal condition. In sleepwalking, the reasoning and its conclusion, the cause and its effect, are present together. In my natural state, the cause vanishing, the effect only and perhaps only partially, remains. These conditions have led me to think that some good results might ensue from a series of well-directed questions propounded to me while mesmerized. You have often observed the profound self-cognizance invented by the sleepwalker, the extensive knowledge he displays upon all points relating to the mesmeric condition itself, and from this self-cognizance may be deduced hence for the proper conduct of catechism. I consented, of course, to make this experiment. A few passes threw Mr. Van Kirk into the mesmeric sleep. His breathing became immediately more easy, and he seemed to suffer no physical uneasiness. The following conversation then ensued. Are you asleep? Yes. No. I would rather sleep more soundly. After a few more passes, I asked, Do you sleep now? Yes. How do you think your present illness will result? There was a long hesitation in speaking as if with effort. I must die. Does the idea of death afflict you? No. No. Are you pleased with the prospect? If I were awake, I should like to die, but now it is no matter. The mesmeric condition is so near death as to content me. I wish you would explain yourself, Mr. Van Kirk. I'm willing to do so, but it requires more effort I am able to make. You do not question me properly. What then shall I ask? You must begin at the beginning. <sighs> the beginning? But what is the beginning? You know that the beginning is... God. This was said in a low, fluctuating tone with every sign of the most profound veneration. What then is God? He hesitated for many minutes. I cannot tell. Is not God spirit? While I was awake, I knew what you meant by spirit, but now it seems only a word. Such, for instance, is truth, beauty, a quality, I mean. Is not God immaterial? There is no immortality. It is a mere word. That which is not matter is not at all unless qualities are things. Is God, then, material? No. This reply startled me very much. What then is he? There was a long pause. I see. But it is a difficult, I see, but it is a thing difficult to tell. He is not spirit, for he exists, nor is he matter as you understand it, but there are gradations of matter of which man knows nothing. The grosser impelling the finer, the finer pervading the grosser. 
the atmosphere, for example, impels the electric principle. Well, the electric principle permeates the atmosphere. These gradations of matter increase in rarity or fineness until we arrive at a matter unparticled, without particles, indivisible, one and here. The law of impulsion and permeation is modified. The ultimate or unparticled matter not only permeates all things, but impels all things, and thus is all things within itself. This matter is God, what men attempt to embody in the word, thought, is this matter in motion. The metaphysicians maintain that all action is reducible to motion and thinking, and that the latter is the origin of the former. Yes, I now see the confusion of idea. Motion is the action of mind, not of thinking. The unparticled matter, or God in quiescence, is, nearly as we can conceive it, what men call mind. And the power of self-movement, equivalent in effort to human volition, is, in the unparticled matter, the result of its unity and omniprevalence. How I know not, and now clearly see, that I shall never know. But the unparticled matter set in motion by law or quality existing within itself is thinking. Can you give me no more precise idea of what you term the unparticled matter? The matters of which man is cognizant escape the senses in gradation. We have four examples, a metal, a piece of wood, a drop of water, the atmosphere, a gas, caloric, electricity, the, the luminiferous ether. Now we all call these things matter and embrace all matter in one general definition. But in spite of this, there can be no two ideas more essentially distinct than that which we attached to a metal and that which we attach to the luminiferous ether. When we reach the latter, we feel an almost irresistible inclination to class it with spirit or with nihility. The only consideration which restrains us in our conception of its atomic constitution, and here even we have to seek aid from our notion of an atom as something possessing an infinite minuteness, solidity, palpability, weight. Destroy the idea of the atomic constitution and we should no longer be able to regard the ether as an entity, or at least as matter. For want of a better word, we might term it spirit. Take now a step beyond the luminiferous ether. Conceive a matter as much more rare than the ether, as this ether is more rare than the metal, and we arrive at once, in spite of all the school dogmas, at a unique mass, an unparticled matter. For although we may admit infinite littleness in the atoms themselves, the infinitude of littleness in the spaces between them is an absurdity. There will be a point, there will be a degree of rarity at which if the atoms are sufficiently numerous and the inner spaces must vanish and the mass absolutely coalesce, by the consideration of the atomic constitution being now taken away, the nature of the mass inevitably glides into what we conceive of spirit. It is clear, however, that it is as fully matter as before. The truth is, it is impossible to conceive spirit, since it is impossible to imagine what is not. When we flatter ourselves that we have formed its conception, we have merely deceived our understanding by the consideration of infinitely rarefied matter. There seems to be an insurmountable objection to the idea of absolute coalescence, and that is the very slight resistance experienced by the heavenly bodies in their revolutions through space. A resistance now ascertained, it is true, to exist in some degree, but which is nevertheless so slight as to have been quite overlooked by the sagacity of even Newton. We know that the resistance of bodies is chiefly in proportion to their destiny. Absolute coalescence is absolute destiny. 
where there are no interspaces, there can be no yielding. An ether absolutely dense would put an infinitely more effectual stop to the progress of a star than would an ether of adamant or of iron. Your objection is answered with an ease which is nearly in the ratio of its apparent unanswerability. As regards to the progress of the star, it can make no difference whether the star passes through the ether or the ether through it. There is no astronomical error more unaccountable than that of which reconciles the known handicapped of the comets with the idea of their passage through an ether. For however rare this ether be supposed, it would put a stop to all sidereal revolution in a very far briefer period than has been admitted by those astronomers who have endeavored to slur over a point which they found it impossible to comprehend. The hold actually experienced is, on the other hand, about that which might be expected from the friction from the ether and the instantaneous passage through the orb. In the one case, the force is momentary and complete with itself. In the other, it is endlessly accumulative. But in all this, in this identification of mere matter with God, is there nothing of irreverence? I was forced to repeat this question before the sleepwalker fully comprehended my meaning. Can you say why matter should be less reverence than mind? But you forget that the matter of which I speak is in all respects the very mind or spirit of the schools, so far as regards its high capacity and is moreover the matter of these schools at the same time. God, with all the powers attributed to spirit, is but the perfection of matter. You assert, then, that the unparticled matter in motion is thought. You say in general. Yes, the universal mind is God. For new individualities, matter is necessary. But you now speak of mind and matter, as do the metaphysicians. Yes, to avoid confusion. When I say mind, I mean the unparticled or ultimate matter. By matter, I intend all else. You say in general, yes, the universal mind is God. For new individualities, matter is necessary. But you now speak of mind and matter, as do the metaphysicians. Yes, to avoid confusion. When I say mind, I mean the unparticled or ultimate matter. And by matter, I intend all else. You were saying that... For new individualities, matter is necessary. Yes, for mind existing in unincorporate is merely God. To create individual thinking beings, it was necessary to incarnate portions of the divine mind. Thus, man is individualized. Divested of corporate investiture, he were God. Now the particular motion of the incarnated portions of the unparticled matter is the thought of man, as the motion of the whole is that of God. You say the divested of the body of man will be God. After much hesitation, he responded, I could not have said this. It is an absurdity. I referred to my notes. You did say that divested of corporate investiture man were God. And this is true. Man thus divested would be God, would be unindividualized, but he can never be thus divested, at least never will be, else we must imagine an action of God returning upon itself, a purposeless and futile action. Man is a creature. Creatures are thoughts of God, it is the nature of thought to be irrevocable. I do not comprehend. You say that man will never be put off the body. I say that he will never be bodiless. Explain. There are two bodies, the rudimental and the complete, corresponding with the two conditions of the worm and the butterfly. What we call death is but a painful metamorphosis. Our present incarnation is progressive, 
perpetuary, temporary. Our future is perfected, ultimate, immortal. The ultimate life is the full design. But of the worm's metamorphosis, we are all palpably cognizant. We, certainly, but not the worm, the matter of which our rudimental body is composed in within the keen of the organs of that body, or, more distinctly, our rudimental organs are adapted to the matter of which is formed the rudimental body, but not to that of which the ultimate is composed. The ultimate body thus escapes our rudimental senses, and we perceive only the shell which falls and decaying from the inner form. Not that inner form itself, but this inner form as well as the shell is appreciable by those who have already acquired the ultimate life. You have often said that the mesmeric state very nearly resembles death. How is this? When I say that it resembles death, I mean that it resembles the ultimate life. For when I am entranced in the senses of my rudimental life are in abeyance, I perceived external things directly without organs through a medium which I shall employ in the ultimate unorganized life. Unorganized? Yes. Organs are contrivances by which the individual is brought into sensible relation with particular classes and forms of matter, to the exultion of other classes and forms. The organs of man are adapted to his rudimental condition and to that only. His ultimate condition being unorganized is of unlimited comprehension in all points but one. The nature of the volition of God, that is to say, the motion of the unparticled matter. You will have a distinct idea of the ultimate body by conceiving it to the entire brain. That it is not, but a conception of this nature will bring you near a comprehension of what it is. The luminous body imparts vibration to the luminiferous ether. The vibrations generate smaller ones within the retina. These again communicate similar ones to the optic nerve. The nerve conveys similar ones to the brain, the brain also similar ones to the unparticled matter which permeates it. The motion of this latter is thought, of which perception is the first undulation. But the ultimate, unorganized life, the external world, reaches the whole body, which is of a substance having affinity to brain, as I have said with no other intervention than that of an infinitely rarer ether than even the luminiferous. And this ether, in unison with it, the whole body vibrates, setting in motion the unparticled matter which permeates it. It is through the absence of the idiosyncratic rudimental beings, the organs or cages necessary to confine them until fledged. You speak of rudimental beings, are there other rudimental thinking beings than man? It's for the sole purpose of supplying pabulum for the idiosyncrasy of the organs of an infinity of rudimental beings. But for the necessity of the rudimental prior to the ultimate life, there would have been no bodies such as these. Each of these is tenanted by a distinct variety of organic rudimental thinking creatures and all the organs vary with the features of the place tenanted. At death, or metamorphosis, these creatures enjoying the ultimate life, immortality, and cognizant of all secrets but the one, act all things and pass everywhere by mere volition, and dwelling not the stars, which to us seem the sole palpabilities, and for the accommodation of which we blindly deem space created, but that space itself, that infinity of which the truly substantive vastness swallows up the star shadows, blotting them out as non-entities from the perception of the angels. You say that, but for the necessity of the rudimental life, there would have been no stars. But why is this a necessity? 
and the inorganic life as well as the inorganic matter generally, there is nothing to impede the action of one simple unique law, the divine volition. With the view of producing impediment, the organic life and matter, complex, substantial, and law-encumbered, were contrived. But again, why need this impediment have been produced? The result of law and violate is perfection, right, negative happiness. The result of law and violate is imperfection, wrong, positive pain. Through the impediments afforded by the number, complexity, and substantiality of the laws of organic life and matter, the violation of law is rendered to a certain extent practical. Thus pain, which in the inorganic life is impossible, is possible to the organic. But what good end is pain thus rendered possible? All things are either good or bad by comparison. A sufficient analysis will show that pleasure in all cases is but the contrast of pain. Positive pleasure is a mere idea. To be happy at any one point we must have suffered at the same. Never to suffer would have been never to have been blessed. But it has been shown that in the inorganic life pain cannot be thus the necessity for the organic. The pain of the primitive life of earth is the sole basis of the bliss of the ultimate life in heaven. Still, there is one of your expressions which I find it impossible to comprehend. The truly substantive vastness of infinity. This probably is because you have no sufficiently generic conception of the term substance itself. We must not regard it as a quality, but a sentiment. It is the perception and thinking beings of the adaptation of matter to their organization. There are many things on Earth which would be nihility to the inhabitants of Venus, many things visible and tangible in Venus which we could not be brought to appreciate as existing at all. But to the inorganic beings, to the angel, the whole of the unparticled matter is substance, that is to say the whole of what we term space, is to them the truest substantiality. The stars, meantime, through what we consider their materiality, escaping the angelic sense is just a portion as the unparticled matter. Though what we consider its immateriality eludes the organic. As the sleepwalker pronounced these latter words in a feeble tone, I observed on his countenance a singular expression which somewhat alarmed me and induced me to wake him at once. No sooner than I'd done this than with a bright smile irritating all his features he fell back upon his pillow and expired. I noticed that in less than a minute afterward his corpse had all the stern rigidity of stone. His brow was the coldness of ice. Thus, ordinarily, should it have appeared only after long pressure from Azrael's hand. Had the sleepwalker indeed, during the latter portion of his discourse, been addressing me from out the region of the shadows.